Hello, Janae here, and once again, I'm joined by music attorney Cassandra Spangler. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into music contracts, specifically work for hire agreements. Now, I learn something new every time Cassandra and I have one of these music industry discussions, and this time, of course, was no different. I would love to know what you learned from our discussion, so let me know by putting a comment in the comments section below. Now, we've done several music industry talks that you can check out at any time. But you know what? If you don't mind, just subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you can be notified when we have another one of our music industry talks or I post any one of my other projects. Okay, let's get started. The information provided in this video is for informational purposes only and not for the purpose of providing legal advice. You should contact an attorney to obtain advice with respect to any particular issue or problem. Once again, we are joined by Miss Cassandra Spangler, attorney extraordinaire for another talk about the music industry. Thank you so much for joining me, Cassandra. Thank you so much for having me, Janae. And today we are going to be talking about work for hire agreements. And when I think about work for hire agreements, of course, I always relate it to me. And I think about the work I do with my producer, Mike, and we have a work for hire agreement. Um, and that's all I think about. But you're going to educate us to think broader. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so as Janae mentioned, we're going to talk about work for hire agreements um, which really boil down to copyright law. So I guess first question, everyone's wondering, what is a work for hire agreement? There are two different situations in which you can have a work for hire agreement under the copyright law. Um, the first is where something is created by an employee within the scope of their employment. So if you have an employee and they create any type of copyrightable work, whether it is a recording or a painting, a photograph, um, if they're doing that within the scope of their employment, then that work can be considered a work for hire. Um, and we'll talk in a minute about what that means and why that's important. Um, the second scenario where a work can be considered a work for hire um, and when I say a work, I mean a copyrightable piece of content, whether it's a visual art or a book or a film or music. All of those things are what I mean when I say a work. So the second scenario, again, first scenario is where an employee is creating something within the scope of their employment. The second scenario is a little bit trickier. Um, this is where something is specially commissioned under a written agreement. And in order to qualify as a work for hire under this second scenario, there are only a few different specific types of works that are allowed. And these are set forth under the Copyright Act, which is the, the law that governs federal copyright in the United States. So in order to qualify under that second category, it has to be a work that has been specially ordered or commissioned for use um, as a contribution to a collective work, part of a motion picture, a translation, a supplementary work, a compilation, an instructional text, a test, an answer material for a test, or an atlas. Um, so you can see they get very specific there, and you can see Notably, for our purposes, what's missing there are things like sound recordings and musical compositions. Congress actually, in 1999, amended the law to include sound recordings as types of works that can be considered works for hire if they're specially commissioned. And there was such an outcry from the music community against that that they quickly thereafter amended it and removed that. So we'll talk in a minute about why that's important. But again, just to kind of summarize a work for hire, it's a contract between you and someone else who is creating something for you. And in order to be considered a work for hire under the copyright law, it has to either be something that is created by an employee within the scope of their employment or something that has been specially commissioned and is one of those things that I, I just mentioned. Huh. Well, that's 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 different. Yeah, it gets it gets very um, technical. And 
you know, the reason why it's important. So if something is considered a work for hire, then under the copyright law, the author of that work is the person it was created for, not the person who created it. So if you have an employee who is taking photographs for you, if it's done within the scope of their employment, then it's a work for hire and you own the copyright in those photographs, not the photographer, which is um, an exception to the general rule. And in, in general, whoever's creating something is the owner or the author of the copyright. If it's a work for hire, that's an exception to that general rule, meaning, again, that the person who it's created for is the person who is the author under the copyright law. This matters for a few reasons. Again, it's going to determine who the author is. And it also affects the length of the copyright protection. So for a standard copyright, something that is not a work for hire, that protection lasts for the author's life plus 70 years. So the, the protection will last as long as the author is alive. And then after they have died, it lasts for another 70 years. If it's a work for hire, then the copyright protection lasts for 120 years from the time it was created or 95 years from the time it was published, whichever is less. So you can kind of see there, there might be some situations where the length of time for a work for hire is actually going to be less than what it would be for a standard work. Other situations, it might be more depending on, you know, when the work was created and how long the author lived. I did not know there was a di uh, different standard. Yep, there's a difference in terms of the length of protection and then also... It can affect what they call the reversionary rights. So under the copyright law for certain types of works, including sound recordings, when someone transfers their copyright in the recording to someone else, they have certain rights to revoke that transfer after 35 to 40 years. That does not apply to works for hire. So this came up in the news um, a few years back. A lot of the copyrights in sound recordings that were transferred by artists to record labels were starting to get into that 35 to 40 year period. And so you started to see a lot of these big time artists who were big back in the 70s suddenly were filing these reversionary claims to get their copyrights back. So that's something that people are able to do unless it's a work for hire, in which case they were never legally considered to be the author and they have no rights, no reversionary rights. So they can't 35 to 40 years later try to get the rights back. So whether or not something is considered to be a work for hire can make a big difference as far as that goes. That makes sense because, yeah, you did not actually sign it over in the first place. The person that hired you is the one owned it from the very beginning. Right. So that's part of why it's really, really important to know what you are doing as, say, um, a session singer or a musician. Somebody hires you to sing a song and that sound recording is released. I think some people might think they own it because they sang it and it's their voice, but they really don't. It can get questionable. I mean, I always tell people the safest thing to do is to have a work for hire agreement just to avoid any questions. You know, the last thing you want is to end up in court and then there's going to be an argument about whether or not the person was an employee. Normally, these work for hire agreements, they will say this was created as a work for hire and then they'll have an extra clause in there that says if for whatever reason it's determined this was not a work for hire, you are hereby transferring your ownership in the copyright. This way you're covered just in case the person takes it to court at some point in the future and says, you know, legally under the copyright law, this wasn't considered a work for hire. Then you have that extra protection that says, well, even if it wasn't, you transferred your copyright ownership. Okay. So this is a scenario where it's always a good idea to, you know, have an attorney put together something. It could be a template you know, where if you're working with various different studio musicians and things, you have this template that you have them sign this way you're covered. And there's no question down the road because there is the potential for someone who is on the recording, if they didn't sign anything, they could make the argument that, you know, they weren't an employee and that they therefore own part of the copyright. So you want to try to avoid 
any of those issues. So then then it's the opposite. All right. If you do a uh, do some session work and you don't sign anything, you potentially have a case to say, hey, I own that. You could. Yeah. And then it would it would come down to some of these technicalities, you know, was the person an employee or not, those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, you just want to try to avoid that as far as you can. Okay. All right. So now that we've gone over some of the kind of technical, you know, copyright law issues of it, um, getting to the more practical side of it, when do you need these kinds of agreements? So one situation is for cover art or any other artwork that someone is creating, whether it's a graphic designer who is creating visual cover art or flyers or a photographer, if you're using a photograph on the cover art, um, you definitely need those people to sign these types of agreements. Otherwise, the photographer or the designer can come back later and say, I created that, I own it. And in fact, there have been a lot of cases where photographers' artwork has been used on the cover of albums without a proper agreement in place, and the photographers have sued um, so it's something that definitely happens. And so it's it's one of those things, again, like the studio musicians where you want to make sure that you have that in writing to avoid these issues later on. Okay. And so if you use a service like Disc Makers, I looked into it and I read that you own it. Disc Makers does not own the artwork that they provide to you because you've, you know, you've paid for them and all that stuff. But they say that you own it, which is good. Yeah, as long as they are giving you something in writing. So they may have their own standard term, you know, standard template that they use that says that, which is great. But you just want to make sure you have something in writing. And then something like Canva. Lots of people use Canva. I use Canva for a lot of different things. And I think I just assumed, I don't believe I read this anywhere, but I just assumed that you own it. You know, if you create something based on a template um, at Canva and, you know, make your changes or whatever, that you then own it. I don't know if you know anything about Canva. I'm not too familiar. Is it something where they have like stock art and then they let you alter it? Yes, exactly. There's infinite ways to alter. Okay, yeah. So for things like that, you want to be careful. You want to look, take a close look at their terms as far as who owns the, the ultimate design. And that comes up to, you know, in, in music, you see a lot of these sites like Splice, where they let you use these so-called royalty-free samples and loops and things like that. Um, so those sites as well, you have to be very careful to take a look at the terms um, as far as what you can and can't do. And normally they keep ownership of their particular sample or loop. And so that can also affect your copyright. And you have to make sure that you register the copyright in the correct way um, if you are going to register the copyright where you're using pre-existing elements from someone else. Interesting. So let's see, when else might you need these types of agreements? So cover art, flyers, website design logos. If you're having someone design a logo, you want to make sure you have an agreement with them stating that you own the logo, the copyright, the trademark, which Janae and I have talked about in other videos. So if you're interested in learning more about trademarks or copyrights, um, you can check out some of our prior videos. Music videos. So there's a lot of different elements involved in music videos that you need to make sure you have all of everything properly cleared. So you know, the, the director of the video, the videographer, you want to have a work for hire agreement from them. Anyone who's appearing in the video, you want to have them sign a waiver for the use of their likeness in the video. Any type of location. So if you're filming in, you know, a recognizable location, you might need to have the location sign a waiver. And then you want to obviously make sure you're not showing anyone's copyright or trademark in the video without a license. So this is why a lot of times in videos or on TV shows, you will see someone's holding a can of Sprite and the Sprite logo is blurred out or someone's wearing a Yankees hat and the Yankee logo is blurred out. That's because you can't use someone else's logo without 
a license for that. Or if it's a painting in the background, sometimes you'll see the painting is blurred out because someone else owns the copyright in that painting and you can't display it. So all of those different elements, um, when you're shooting a music video, you want to make sure you have all of those things cleared. Mixers, masterers, engineers, all of those people to be safe, you know, you, you should have them sign a work for hire agreement. A lot of them may have their own template um, because they deal with it all the time. So that makes things easier for artists. And then finally, studio musicians, as we discussed before, you want to make sure that you have them sign some sort of work for hire agreement just to avoid any issues down the road where people are trying to claim, you know, that they own part of the copyright, which you would think, you know, that it there should be no issue and everything's fine. But, you know, I guarantee you if the song is number one on Billboard, all of a sudden, everybody who had any, you know, someone's coughing in the background of the recording, they're going to come forward and try to claim partial ownership. So to the extent that you can have all of this stuff on paper taken care of ahead of time, it's going to make everyone's life much easier. If you don't have that stuff in place and, you know, you've been working with certain people for years and years and years, is it recommended to then start now and actually put all that stuff down in a contract and have them sign it? I mean, I would say it's always safest to do that. But, you know, if it's a song that was recorded 10 years ago and it's been out for 10 years, it's probably less of a priority than new new music. There's a statute of limitations um, for copyright infringement is three years. So, you know, if you release the song and more than three years have passed, it makes it much more difficult for someone to come forward and try to claim that they own part of it or anything like that. Not impossible, you know, if they can show that they didn't know about it for some other reason, but in general, it's much more difficult if it's been out for more than three years. So I would say priority wise is anything moving forward. Make sure you have all these agreements in place. And then if you have the budget and you have the time to go back and do it for the older stuff, then it's it's the safest thing to do, but it's not always practical. Okay. I didn't actually think about the people mastering your music. So that is something I will have to do. Yeah. Yep. And engineers, some engineers, but only the very, very top you know, engineers, they will want a royalty, but most all of the rest understand that it's being done as a work for hire and, and they should have no problem signing a work for hire agreement. Okay. And and so when you say engineers, like if I go to a recording studio, say, and I have somebody in the booth that is handling all of the engineering part, that is who you're talking about. Right. Okay. The important thing there is usually the engineers have all the files. So, you know, you want to be extra careful, not to say that anyone's going to release it or anything like that, but you want to be extra careful and make sure that it's clear on paper that you own the recordings and the files, even though they're in the possession of the engineer or the studio. That's exactly right. Yeah, you do have to hand all that over because how are they going to do their job without it? These work for hires is something that you should have your music attorney write up for you, right? Yes, I I would recommend doing that. A lot of times, you know, people find templates online and you have to be very careful, especially with something like this where it seems like it's simple, but as we discussed at the beginning, it can get very technical. And there have been court cases, you know, where... Someone signed a work for hire agreement and then later on it was determined in court that the work involved couldn't be a work for hire. So you want to make sure it's properly drafted to cover you. Um, As I mentioned, where it's going to say this is a work for hire, but if for whatever reason it's determined that it's not, you're still transferring ownership. Um, And a lot of the online templates don't include that language. So I definitely recommend that you have a lawyer put one together for you. And if people wanted to hire you for work for hire agreements, can they can they do that? Sure. The easiest way to get in touch is to go to my website, which is cspanglermusiclaw.com. And then from there, you can find phone number, email, social media, all of those other contact methods. Okay. 
Wonderful. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I work with you and you're super easy to work with. And so I would always recommend that people contact you uh, to do this. And, and I also feel like you are somebody that if you can't help them, you're going to tell them and then possibly refer them to somebody else that could or some service that they need versus you. Definitely. Definitely. Yep. And, you know, even if you think you don't need this stuff, it's always so much easier to do it now rather than, you know, when the song blows up overnight, which nowadays happens all the time with social media, TikTok, everything else. So it's always good to have this stuff in place rather than finding yourself spending a gazillion dollars in some lawsuit. Um, So, you know, this is stuff that's important for artists that are just starting out all the way up through artists who are um, well-established. So true. How many people have like literally released their very first song (laughs) and the next thing you know, they are a superstar and it's like, wow. So yeah. And I mean, everybody I think hopes that that will happen for them. The, the likelihood is just not very high, uh, but it does happen. It definitely happens. And if you are starting behind the eight ball, uh, it definitely would be a a bit of an uphill battle that you probably don't want to deal with because you don't want to get soured on the music industry. You know, this is what you want to do. Do it, but do it right. Yep, exactly. It's, It's your investment and it's your work. So you want to make sure that you protect it. Absolutely. So thank you so much again, Cassandra. Love having these talks because as you know, I always go, oh, I didn't know that. (laughs) You are a wonderful educator. So thank you very much. And I know everybody appreciates it as always. Thank you for having me. You just heard my discussion about work for hire agreements in the music industry with music attorney, Cassandra Spangler. Thank you so much for tuning in. Did you learn something? let me know in the comments section below. If you'd like to contact Cassandra, I put a link to her website in the description below as well. You're going to love working with her. I love doing these talks with Cassandra. I learned something. I'm hoping you learned something. Do me a favor, subscribe to the channel. Listen to all of our talks. Lots of information in those talks. You can also check out my music and other interviews and projects. And if you enjoy this conversation, be sure to like the video, share it with all your music friends, and ring the bell for notifications. Last but not least, remember, your music is valuable. So create, protect, and release.